The timing couldn't be more perfect to delve into digital health adoption. Our panel will dissect into these barriers, seeking solutions to ensure that no one is left behind in this digital health revolution. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Mark Scrimshire, Chief Interoperability Officer at Onyx Technology LLC and panelists, D. Katz Shakar, CEO and founder of Bodyholic, Bodyholic Andre Nenirad, VP of Corporate Strategy at Intelligent Medical Objects, Igor Zijan, founder and CEO of System of All LLC, and Carlin Fitzpatrick, co-founder and business development director at OnCode Health. Panelists, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so since we've done basically brief introductions, uh, one of the things that I think we need to, to look at here is, you know, I think we, as we just heard in the previous session, you will all be or have been patient at some time. And so the question I think that comes out of this when we're talking about breaking down the barriers of, of digital health adoption is how do we actually engineer this system so that we can be equal partners or our caregivers can be equal partners in dealing with our, our health and wellness. And so first I wanna ask a, a, just a couple of questions. Uh, who in the audience, raise your hand if you've got a health or wellness app on your phone or maybe even on your watch. Let's just see who we've got out here. Yeah, okay, so of those of you, how many of you have actually shared any of that information with your doctor? So a few, so we're getting somewhere, aren't we? So healthcare is a really broad subject. In the US here, what, it's 17, 18% of the, the economy. Uh, and so it covers a lot of areas. So each of uh, my colleagues here on the panel, I'd like you to just basically uh, give us the perspective that you are coming from when we talk about digital health adoption. So maybe just take a minute or two just to, to give your perspective on where you're coming from. So Di, maybe if you want to... to... Oh, there we go. Maybe We've that one will or we'll switch again. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, first of all, I wanna say just a word about where I actually come from. Uh, I flew over here yesterday from Israel, uh, which is a country that is very, 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 the healthcare is very much based on digital healthcare, and it's uh, a very strong HMO system. And uh, from my perspective, and I'm I'm very aware of what's happening in Europe in different spaces, and also in the states, and it's very different uh, from what I'm used to and what I see on a regular basis. But the thing that I am concerned about most, uh, as a public health promoter and professional is the accessibility, not only for the patient, but also the digital orientation and accessibility for the provider, because not all the doctors are actually comfortable yet with the um, digital healthcare. So I wanna keep it short and uh, we're gonna move on. Great. Test. Uh, yeah, so um, my experience, Andre Nimrod, VP Corporate Strategy with Intelligent Medical Objects. Uh, we've been in the industry uh, working on foundational clinical content for the vast majority of healthcare. So as docs are documenting at the point of care, you know, how do you define a patient's diagnoses or a procedure? And then we keep all that content up to date behind the scenes for, you know, 98% of the U.S. healthcare market. So we have a, a unique understanding of how different software applications and digital um, so, uh, software tools that uh, clinicians, coders, billers, uh, payers, plans, uh, CROs, life science organizations use to leverage better insights into patient lives. And I think the big challenges that we see um, are, are probably twofold, just to keep this short. Um, one is a preponderance and a focus on what is the minimum viable um, deployment of a, of a solution to meet a technological need. And a lot of times a minimum deploy, uh, minimum viable deployment only adheres to maybe 70%, 80% accuracy to meet the governing requirements of what you're trying to accomplish. And as we all know in healthcare, if you're only 80% um, accurate, you're probably not doing that for the vast majority of your population. And that's, that's a problem. And then secondly, uh, because a lot of these applications are based upon uh, software engineers working in collaboration with clinicians, it was very interesting on the last panel, um, you know, you might do everything within a, 
a, a software ecosystem or a software box, and then as soon as you deploy it into um, into finality with the organization, you have a hard time actually going live because data might be different at, at an organization to organization. So um, having that not only minimum viable challenge, but also dealing with clinical viability of its deployment methodologies um, is a challenge in digital adoption that we see industry-wide. So Eagle, uh, what's your perspective on this? Well, I believe that everyone is trying to somehow regulate their information the best possible manner because we are all facing uh, the same difficulties we have seen as well let's say not only in healthcare industry we have seen as well the airlines social media platforms everywhere so but healthcare is really sensitive why because we have their really sensitive information about us that means what exactly is happening with our health with our state uh, with our uh, plans uh, record about the plan about the health about everything what we are now, if we are taking the entire healthcare system into consideration, so what we are doing, let's say that I introduced myself, my name is Igor Zian, I'm a founder and uh, I, I'm actually creator of the company System of All as well. And we are working in probably one of the biggest high tech revolutions ever. It means bringing the brainwave technology to the market. Uh, Probably you have all already heard about government conspiracy stories or about uh, devices reading brain, etc. So this was like a big polemic. Is this possible or not? So what is happening now, let's say in the last few years, we are bringing those devices to the market in the form of the, of the prothesis of uh, gaming consoles, etc. But you have so less information in the market, what this actually means. It means we have uh, let's say we have the uh, we have the uh, we have the called the prothesis arm prothesis leg prothesis which are which have implemented the brainwave computers in the in the models. They are taking data out from our brain, bringing as well data back to our brain, which is showing to us that we can actually segregate the algorithm from show its functionality on the computer, and we read actually what is happening with our brain. Now. The biggest problem is how to protect this data because of course in 80s this was easier why because who had the, who had computers in 80s those were governments we know if there was something wrong we somehow blame the government we somehow deal with these problems now today this is a little bit more difficult because we have 8 billion people population grew to 8 billion we have all smart devices we have all smartphones uh, we have all so capable technology at home that uh, almost everyone can access this technology as well to their home basement for even for entrepreneurship development. Now, how to control it? Of course, we all were relying on the government, we were relying on, on Interpol, we were relying on Europol, we were relying on CIA, NSA. We somehow rely that if anything happens, that this is somehow, okay, it's a government decision or we trust the government, government makes the right decision. Well, it's not anymore so easy because uh, government cannot assure that they can control what 8 billion people does. So somehow we need to bring this knowledge further. We need to bring this knowledge to different ministry, not only to the healthcare, as well to education, as well to the science, and then to the other, I would say, uh, organizations as police, uh, local hospitals, small organizations. So. And why is this so important? Because we are getting now those devices in the commercial use. You can already order now. You have on internet. You can you can buy so-called uh, brainwave consoles. You can your children can play video games only with the brain using brains. Uh, companies are developing uh, so-called uh, brainwave applications. It means uh, typing your messages uh, only with your mind, etc. So this is now coming through technology, but people are still not familiar with it. They're facing extremely big problems. If they use them, they come to hospitals. Psychiatry so still treat them as the uh, behavior phenomenon, which is described as schizophrenia paranoia. And now somehow we are clipping the system. We are turning the system, which is on one side causing big frictions. Of course, we understand that there is a lot of um, gain and a lot of uh, disadvantages in this, but we need supportive system. It means from every local community, that they are familiar with this because it's impossible to control as i already so, said what eight billion people does in their so uh, Igor, uh, i think you're, you're coming very much from the policy and regulatory framework but 
How about, Carmen, you've come over from the UK. Um, what's your perspective on digital health and what's it, what it means to you? Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yes, my name's Carl Fitzpatrick. I'm an orthopedic surgeon by background. Thank you. And um, also a co-founder at Encode Health. So I think for me, it's twofold, really. It, from a very clinical perspective and what digital health means for my daily practice. And um, actually, it was great hearing the, uh, the previous talk. I think that the work they're doing um, there is, is, is fantastic. I think that's the direction of travel we should be going in because really what that says to me is that the digital innovation that we're all creating and, and interested in, certainly as entrepreneurs that we're sort of striving towards, should really be underpinned by one, augmenting the work that clinicians do on the front line on a daily basis, and actually making us better and more effective at our jobs. And secondly, producing products, services, and tools um, that are meaningful and impactful to our patients. Um, and so that's certainly my interest um, from a clinical perspective and also my work with Encode Health. And um, so to go sort of directly to your question, digital health means to me creating a, um, a series of tools, technologies, services that we can deploy effectively into the healthcare market. And what that means is having our doctors seamlessly integrate their current workflows and maybe even adapt and evolve their workflows to meet the, the new capabilities of digital health, but actually fundamentally do their jobs in a more effective and efficacious way. And for patients, it should be something that is um, allows healthcare to be delivered to them more effectively and actually, and I hopefully we'll come on to this point a bit later on, perhaps take more interest and um, responsibility for their own health um, using some of these tools that we're now producing, which allow a lot more interaction between patients and the healthcare services that serve them. So it really for me, that's what digital health means and um, is hopefully moving towards. Thanks, thanks Carla. So from my perspective, uh, digital health, I really come at this from the interoperability and the standards world. So it's really fascinating in the previous session, they're saying what's the big challenge is, yes, we can have all of these single point solutions, but how do we scale that to be able to take that across the industry? And so that's where I've been working in uh, trying to define the specifications that allow us to be interoperable and be able to move data and particularly to try and release that data to us as patients so that we can make use of that. And then the big barrier I think we have to really look at is how do patients start to feed that data back? And if we take Igor's sort of your uh, perspective on uh, really what's the policy and the regulatory frameworks that allow that to happen without us being harmed by it. So there's a lot of initiative here in the, in the US about privacy, and concerns about the data that we're sharing. And we need to make sure that we're able to share data where we need to, but without it coming back to bite us. So, uh, Carl, since you started with what, what does digital health mean to, to, to you? How about, Di, if you, you want to just explain what, what, digi what you think digital health really means from, from your perspective, from that wellness perspective? Um, just just uh, as a response to what you just said, Mark, and um, what my colleagues here said, uh, one of the things that also concerns me the most is, uh, this is really a response, uh, who owns the data? And uh, I wonder if it is uh, the patient, the health care provider company, or the tech company that's actually creating the, the interoperable space. And um, how do we protect the patient? Because after all, that that is who the data is coming from. But the question is who owns the data? And um, you might actually be able to answer a little bit more, but from what I know, it's actually up in the air. Well, in the I, threw, I threw that and right back at you. <laughs> I know you, you, you really did. And I think, Andre, you can probably pick up on that because uh, the work that you're doing in analytics is actually make, trying to make use of this data. So really, what do you see from the, you, around digital health? What's it really mean to you? Yeah, and, and uh, I think what all of our panelists are identifying here, too, is, is the different user personas are getting access to data in a lot of disparate ways. And as, as let's, like, let's say as an example, as a, as a payer or a plan, 
Um, a lot of times they're only receiving claims information. So the understanding that they have on a patient might only be in a ICD code or a CPT code uh, methodology. Um, but if you're trying to marry that with clinical information to get a much more robust understanding on your patient information, from your payer's perspective, if your user personas that have been uh, managing data on a regular basis, trying to get access to that clinical information, you know, other disorders of the phosphorus, as a, an example with a rare genetic type of hyperphosphatasia, does not mean hyperphosphatasia. So as you're trying to bridge the gap between data, as you're trying to better understand data assets yourself or any kind of use case you're trying to achieve, um, being cognizant that the people that are actually massaging data for any given use case out there can be um, really underprepared for the tsunami of information that's going to be coming to them at any given point. And if your end goal is trying to achieve uh, patient engagement solutions for care coordination out into the field, or if you're trying to say like, hey, you're Cleveland Clinic and you wanted to spin up a new organization within Australia, but you've now uh, set up a brick and mortar building in the UAE and the UK, as well as in uh, Cleveland Clinic itself, home base in the United States, um, understanding uh, local uh, di dialects, understanding local operations and bringing that into the whole health healthcare ecosystem so you can understand your patient population as a whole and take action on that. Again, it's a different user persona type that's trying to govern that information and make access to that information. And, and that's always gonna be a moving target. Right. Um, there's a there's a couple of folks in the in the audience here that are dealing with genomics information. You throw genotypic or phenotypic representation on top of that data, and that's a whole new data asset that user personas don't really don't have access to. So how do you make that digitized into a format that a software engineer fresh out of college, probably 25, um, going from UCLA, can actually better understand that, especially when you have a geneticist breathing over their shoulders to make sure that the success of that data is achieving a goal that they're trying to. Uh, accomplish. It's, it's, a, it's a moving moving target. So when you really think about digitization and get back into that, the challenge that I, I've seen in the marketplace, a lot of organizations only adhere to the minimum acceptance criteria of success. And that's and that has been problematic for care, and especially in rare disorder types and especially in pediatric use cases too. Um, but it's, it's an industry-wide problem and um, something that I think we first need to be cognizant of and making sure that we trust the access to that information and trust um, through some sort of governance or operation, the, the data ecosystem is, is dirty and take action to clean it. So that's some great points there. So I was actually on a, a webinar last week and uh, one of my, my colleagues said, uh, the, use the term malicious compliance, which is what when we were talking about patient access to data, there's been a lot of initiatives in the US, there's been regulations by CMS, where they're basically saying you must release data to your members if you're a health plan. And many plans have done this, but they've not promoted it to their patients, they've not recruited apps to come in and be able to get that data that their patient, their members can use. And so I think we've really got to move past this. And I think one of the key things and it was said in one of the panel sessions yesterday, it's really about trust. When I, when I was working at CMS um, and building uh, the Blue Button 2 API, trust was job one. And it, it really worked from a number of perspectives. One is we didn't want to have the administrator having to go and sit in front of Congress to explain why something went wrong. But we also wanted the patients, the beneficiaries, to be able to trust that we were doing the right thing in making the data available and trying to encourage the right sort of apps to come forward that they could choose to use. So, Igor, from that sort of policy perspective, what do you see as, you know, really where we're trying to get to with digital health? What does it mean to you? So the, the policy perspective is, I would say, is one of the basics. If we don't have policies, we don't have, to have I would say, any control. So if you imagine how society was built, uh, one of the basic of, of society is, uh, is, a, is a law, or if we don't have a law, then we have a mess. So what is the best control in any organization? It's a policy which is following the law and a policy which is following the regulation. Otherwise, I mean, a lot of things are some trust, but I think the trust is between us or mm -hmm. trust is between organizations, trust is between good clients. But we don't see what is happening externally from our environments. We have a lot of people that have different interests. 
So they can violate those policies. We don't know with what Trump proposes. And we do not care what, what Trump proposes. It means once when policy is violated, when crime is done, it's not. and that's why we are doing exactly what we are doing. It's, it's easy because let's say what is traceable, then we can do it. We can. It's actually happened with this. We can prove things, we can prosecute things, we can always say somehow compare what is happening uh, between us and our competitors, what is happening with our clients. No problem is if policies do not exist because it means that no one is tracing actually what is happening, or, and this is coming to the mistakes as well in organizations. So let's say our work is more based, I mean, we are working on, ma on macro and on micro policy strategies. Our micro are more based on our own internal developments, and which are probably one of the most specific models and examples as well for the external forms, let's say how the policy should work and etc. But we are probably one of the first companies, on the, we are actually the first company on the planet that we actually to move this policy. We, su we successfully actually implemented the law in the United States of America, now recognizing technological abuses so people are not anymore treated with behavior phenomena. Uh, we have also new, te new technological policies, we have new regulation, and now we are somehow working behind the companies. We are actually pushing governments forward. We are pushing European Parliament, European Commission. So we are actually working on a big mess. It means we come to your government and we look for mistakes and we literally require them and they follow the policy and then they start working on the, on the micro elements with ministry, means Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Development, and so on. So, on. so if you have company, I would just, of course, I mean, I would advise everyone the same. Look the regulatory. You all have ISO, FDA regulators in the United States, you have FDA. Now they are trying to somehow synchronize them somehow together, follow those policies, have strict policies. Um, follow the rules, and uh, if uh, something is outside, I would say, of scope of these policies, uh, then of course, uh, here are we. we are then actually taking care that uh, with the governments and the organizations, everything follows on the place. So, do you mind if I interject? Certainly. Thank you. Um, what you're saying, Igor, is really important, I feel, because the, the big issue here is that I think policy and uh, regulations don't move as fast as technology. Mm. So when you, when you come in and you try to make uh, order out of the mess, um, is that what you said? Did, uh, yeah, yeah. And I really, exactly. and, it, and, it, and I, it resonated with me. Um, it's, it's very important. I think uh, policy and regulations have to have um, people backing it up who are as fast as, if not faster, mm as uh, the tech companies. Hmm. We, we've seen some really interesting things going on here in the US. So uh, the, if you take the example of the CMS interoperability and patient access rule, so that was passed a couple of years ago, they're now working on this prior authorization rule. And what's been required is that this industry group, so in HL7, uh, has been developing implementation guides that say, this is how you should do this, in this case, prior authorization. Because to the point from the previous session, unless we all do it the same way, you do not have interoperability and you cannot share data. You just, everything becomes a point solution. It doesn't scale. So the interesting thing there is how industry groups are having to get together to, to create those specifications so that the regulators can point at something for you to be able to implement as a technologist. And that's been a really interesting dynamic when you're seeing politicians creating the legislation, the uh, departments then creating the regulations to enforce the legislation, and the technologists like ourselves then actually trying to implement this in a way that we can actually share data. So let's move, since we're going in the cycle, Carl, and why don't you uh, pick up the next question. I'm going to ask two questions, right, based on, on really the title of this session. This next one is really, what do you see as the barriers 
to digital health adoption. And then we can talk about, we'll do a second, the f second probably final round of what are we each trying to do to really break down those barriers? So Carmen, maybe if you want to take it away with really what you see as the barriers that we're really trying to get. And, I, and it's interesting, each of us really bring a different perspective. It's, it's a fascinating panel. Um, yeah, I mean, I think coming from that different perspective, firstly, I'm you know, from a UK health system, which fundamentally works differently to the way it does here. And so we have a very unique set of barriers to digital health. Um, the first being actually just the way we're resourced and actually the, the incentives for changing and updating clinical practice. And as, as you know, the NHS is a fantastic organization, but really does have its limitations in terms of what it can deliver and the scope of um, services we can deliver as clinicians. And just to give a bit of background to that, even within orthopedics, our list of procedures covered under the NHS has reduced significantly in the last 10 years. And so when you start talking about bringing in digital health solutions and actually something that's going to require resourcing from a particular trust or from a local government level, you really have to justify that clinically and show the impact you're going to have from that digital um, solution. So that's, I mean, that's without getting into regulations or any of the other interesting things we've spoken about there's a real justification issue. Um, so from our perspective at ENCODE Health, what we're doing is something that has been mandated from a regulatory perspective, um, and we're tracking and tracing medical devices, which um, both MDR and HIPAA here in the US have mandated as something that should be done digitally and will improve practice, but then coming to actually implement that into a healthcare system such as the NHS um, is very difficult because the stock answer is, well, we already have a tracking system we you know we've got a paper trail of all the devices we use and it works we've been doing it for years and you're asking us to invest in a in a piece of digital software or, or a technology that yes will improve that but is that really urgent given that we've got so many other pressures so that's definitely the first barrier that that i see on a day-to-day -day basis um the second actually is a very clinical one in that i will um, present my digital solution to my colleagues and the first question I'll, I'll, I'll get is well how long is this going to take me to, to interact with you know I've got 10 minutes to see a patient diagnose a patient make a care plan um, do my surgical planning call theatre scheduling to get the theatre booked get the devices booked you know I've got 15 minutes to do all of that and now you're telling me I need to use an app as well so I think um, that's the second barrier is actually getting my colleagues to really engage and and um, and adopt digital health um, and you know in a way that they feel it's going to improve their daily lives. Um, so those are the two big things that I see. And of course, you know, I, mean, I think some of my other panelists here are more qualified to talk about the you know the um, regulatory perspectives and sort of those parts. But from a clinical perspective on the ground, um, those are really quite practical and large barriers that I see. Yeah. So, Di, you, you come at this from a wellness perspective, so what do you see? Steve, sorry. No, sorry. it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so say it, sorry. So you come at this from a wellness perspective, so uh, what do you see as the barriers that really prevent us from uh, adopting what we're calling digital health or where you're trying to get us to? Um, my uh, hands-on experience is the education uh, where in, in Israel specifically there is uh, an entire Ethiopian community uh, there's a Russian community that doesn't speak uh, Hebrew or English and doesn't have any understanding not everybody especially not the young generation or the older generation uh, the digital health system, and it, like I said, it's that's the way the HMO works in Israel, is completely foreign to them. And not only that, it um, you know, digital health can be such an empowering thing for a patient, but for these specific people, it's actually intimidating. Uh, so I think in in that perspective, and this also applies. Uh, to the states and it applies to uh, Europe and everywhere because socioeconomic status is a big issue here and there are many, many, many people who just will not deal with their health because the digital health space is intimidating to them and that's where we are right now. That's what is taking over 
the healthcare system. And I think education has to be absolutely at the top of our, our priority because uh, I feel that it's a matter of life and death. It's teaching people how to work with uh, digital healthcare is can save their lives. That's um, one. And then also from the provider's uh, perspective, like I mentioned before, there are uh, healthcare providers and mostly from the older generation who are excellent physicians, uh, don't really want to deal with the uh, digital health space. And also there, it's a matter of education and um, they absolutely have the capability and it's also a matter of empowering these people. Hmm. So, Andre, what do you see as the, the barriers that are preventing achieving what you see as you know, digital health? Yeah, yeah, and um, highlighted a few of them uh, earlier uh, already, but when you really think about, I think, what the panelists are, are getting at to, um, one is a focus on what is right in front of you. If you're dealing with, like, CMS's interoperability rules, you have to change your whole back-end data ecosystem to adhere to that regulatory compliance. And obviously, that's a priority for a lot of organizations. I have to deal with this, else I'm going to get my hand slapped by CMS or Maccabi or NHS Digital or any of these organizations. So if I'm not um, adhering to that regulatory environment, then that's that's my focus as an organization. The, the second piece in digitalization is how do I deal with um, the financial uh, benefit to any type of digital uh, operation that I'm trying to bring to market. And um, I think the point, Doctor, you're trying to bring up is if I'm if I'm trying to uh, do change management for my clinical organization, um, I have to take in the total cost of ownership of what that digital product uh, will be to the organization. And it's not just the underlying license; it's the implementation of that solution as well as the change management to bring that to market. And if that completely overshadows what the value is or what the perceived value is, then di the digitalization will not occur. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost a math game that a lot of organizations take, and you have to prove that time and time again, not only as a software company, but as a, a change management organization like an SVP or a VP of an organization trying to move the ball forward even within a health system yourself. And, and those are all challenges that organizations have to take on a regular basis. So to, to serve a solution to that kind of uh, area, you have to be cognizant of those market forces that are ever-changing, ever-present, and uh, and talk to them on a regular basis. Can I just quickly jump in? I mean, I think that's a great point, um, Andre, because I mean, one of the things that we're doing is talking, is trying to create a layer between the um, device suppliers and the uh, and the healthcare institutions that they serve. And so actually we're, you know, we're saying to device suppliers, we can add value to you. But of course, as an innovative product, it's a conceptual value that we know that we can provide. But of course, we can't demonstrate that until it's in play. And so there's a real challenge there. And I, I take the point of um, being able to demonstrate the value of your digital solution before it's implemented. And so you're in a case that, you know, you're, you're modeling, you're, doing, you're actually virtually modeling the outcomes before you've demonstrated them. And that, that can be a real challenge as well, actually, mm. to, um, to bring your innovation to market, even though you know you can do fantastic things once you're there. So, Igor, what, what do you see as the barriers that we've, we've really got to try and address? So, it's a, this is, a, as you mentioned, it's such a nice dynamic because we have, I would say, we have like organizational point of view, we have, uh, as well from our side, we have legislation point of view. So, the biggest challenge is the dynamic, actually, I feel because there is so many different models which are developing or so many great ideas and so many good innovations. And then we need a regulatory which can follow all those innovations. Or, and somehow we need to get the right ideas, right proposals at the right time on the market and that we know, okay, uh, are we going to be fast enough that the company is still going to be sufficient with their input, with their investment, to still getting the gain for their own profit because the company needs, needs to survive. Or, and uh, now postponing those processes that someone invests into his patent in the process, $1 billion, and then he's waiting 10 years on legislation. It's really too long. Right? So the big problem is corruption, because uh, let's say I, I see exactly what is happening as well around the Senate, around the European Parliament, around the European Commission. People just expect that they will get some kind of benefit before it really happens. And this is a really big problem. It means, uh, um, legislation should happen faster. There should be proposals, there should be transparency of the happening 
in some kind of policy visual data policy software where organizations or let's say the so-called the government organizations they can see what changes are happening instantly and then they can obviously update the policies at the right time and mm. this is missing it means we are going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and a lot of people miss out of the time as well with their policy uh, with their integrations they call it integrations they get innovation but uh, legislation needs to be then of course updated and we are missing this time and mostly i mean governments are doing a great job but uh, there is still a big part of the corruption involved as in europe as in the united states um i mean really good advice is if you have a company work there where policies are stable a lot of companies they try to test themselves in the third class governments and a lot of times they fail and it's a really good experience of a lot of entrepreneurs a lot of experienced companies uh, don't go there where the field is too sensitive it means if you if you feel that there is something which is unstable we are saying something stinky don't go there probably you're not going to do anything better as a lot of people before you did or so if policies are not on the place you will need to waste a lot of money with uh, different kind of, I would say, uh, governmental procedures which are delayed and probably you're going to be turned over the same process many times before they will try to follow the policy, which for now they are coming, uh, I would say two basics are Washington DC and the Brussels, which are for the European Union. And so this is where we are somehow segregating ISO standards with help of the Iceland, Netherlands, and as well the Washington DC. Okay, so I'm going to give the audience fair warning. We are going to have time for questions, hopefully. So just think about what you might want to ask this great panel. Um, I think there's a couple of themes coming out before I pass to each of you to say, you know, what are you doing to try and break down these barriers and really drive things forward? I think what we, we're hearing is there needs to be sort of lightweight regulation. There needs to be specifications that we can all work with um, but there needs to be trust in the because without trust we're not going to want to exchange data with anyone um, and you know I, I go back to times I spent with with uh, health plans and if you think of, if you translate that into you know what's on your smartphone I, I challenge you to go and look at anybody else's uh, phone and see what apps they have on their front page every one of us I bet is different and that's, I think, the secret of where we need to head with, with digital health is it's not one 100% solution, but we are going to each individually pick, you know, maybe 20 or 30 different, you know, three, four, five percent, ten percent solutions that meet our needs. And we need to have the information that supports that. So from my perspective, what am I doing to try and break down these barriers and really uh, drive things forward. So I'm going to ask each of you what you're, what you're doing. You know, my work has been to spend time writing specifications so that the uh, regulators can point to those specifications and say, when I move from one health plan to another, I'll be able to tell my new health plan, go get my data from the last health plan. So I've now got my longitudinal record building constantly. And when I'm going to go see a provider, the provider should be able to go knock on the door of the health plan and tell me, what do you know about my patient? And they'll be able to get the data because in, in certainly in the US, what we see is the health plan, I describe it as they have the connective tissue of your care journey because they've got, they know where you've been uh, because there've been claims, but they may not know a lot about what went on at each place, whereas the provider has maybe a very deep view of what they've been treating you for, but they don't know everything else that's going on in where you're getting treatment. Particular problems with like the Veterans Administration, where there's, there's veterans being treated by the VA, but also out in the private sector, and they don't necessarily know what's going on. So I'm working on interoperability, trying to help providers, payers be able to create these interfaces so they can share data in a consistent manner. So why don't we run down the panel? So Di, what are you doing to really 
make this happen. Um, like I like I talked about earlier, that education is uh, more my forte, and uh, the my goal is to decrease health disparities. So um, going to different populations, teaching them how to use specifically in Israel, um, the, the apps, uh, how to reach out. And um, I think in general, uh, and this is not specifically to my area, but I think in general, uh, education for the, and empowering the younger generation to actually go and teach their elders is uh, one of the strongest ways to make a difference in that. And the other thing is, and this I'm not doing anything about, um, but the health disparity issue is is the one that is closest to my heart. And um, the financial barrier is a huge barrier in the digital health space because digital health costs a lot of money. And uh, I think there has to be some kind of uh, subsidy. Uh, so I'm just putting that out there as someone who doesn't live in the States. <laughs> You're Thank speaking you. my language. I've for a long, a long time actually. Anybody that listens is, you know, we can go to the doctors and get an annual checkup for free in this country on certain plans. Why can't I also charge for a digital subscription? Because one of the challenges I think we've got in the U.S. here is there's no real business model for third-party consumer apps, health apps, unless you are the product. Right, and if you were able to dictate where the money is being spent, you become the customer, and I think that's one of the things we've got to solve. So, I'll get off my hobby horse, and Andre. So, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, and I'll give you guys a, a personal experience here, just me personally, what I'm trying to accomplish. I'll get, um, so I had a family member; um, she had stage one estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. For those of you that are in the coding world, um, that's three ICD-10 codes and four SNOMED codes. So when you think about how that patient's data is sent downstream, if you're only adhering to the minimum acceptance criteria of that transmission, um, patient only has breast cancer. So to give you guys a real life experience about what happens here, if that patient, um, let's say seen at Northwestern or UNLV over here, um, gets uh, a referral for a dermatologist for uh, cystic acne, the dermatologist probably doesn't know that they have estrogen receptor status. They probably don't know that they have BRAC positivity because these are secondary codes that are attached to the patient record. Now, in our my uh, family member's case, that estrogen receptor status did not come along here, right? And so they prescribed an estrogen positive uh, ointment to the patient. Medication management rules didn't kick off. Um, the plan uh, successfully reimbursed for that. Um, and that's a problem when you really think about that. And we probably all have stories um, of family members dealing with oncology uh, use cases where uh, I, your family member didn't get the appropriate care because of some of these rule operations not getting triggered appropriately behind the scenes. What drives me as a person working in this ecosystem is making sure that that does not happen to this, this generation and to that next generation. And if we can provide trust into that ecosystem and trust back into that operation and uh, anything that I can do with my company to help enable that trust in that data, I'll do it to the end of the earth. That's, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. Awesome. So get your questions ready. Uh, if, you, if you have a question, if you go to the mic, uh, we will be happy to take questions. But Igor, what, what are you doing? You've done some really interesting stuff with uh, administrations. So what are you doing to break down these barriers? It's a, it's a good point, yes. But it's good as well to understand like why we are doing it. Right? So um, we are, I mean, we are definitely not going to go back. Or we are somehow developing humanity. Or we are not going to leave our technology development and go back to caves. So we somehow need to realize that it's necessary as well what we are doing, all of us. Um, now, what we are doing, of course, are literally, we are those we are bothering government organizations. I would say critical points that they are missing, and we are literally working a lot. We are trying to do this like gentle, politic wise. We are trying to do this uh, like policy wise.
constituted in our state technology uh, violation uh, legislations. It's uh, probably one of the probably one of the I would say most difficult uh, breakthroughs that we actually succeed to do, but we did it. And uh, now we are not sitting on this. It means we are continuing. Now we are literally bothering out European mm. Commission, European Parliament, uh, entire United Kingdom, I can say, Switzerland. I think, I think your mic is... So, Carmen, why don't you wrap up with what you're, you're doing to uh, yeah. address... Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think um, for me the key word would be advocacy. So, uh, Dee touched on it um, with the education work that she's doing in Israel, which I think is you know, really, really pertinent. Um, because ultimately, again, as uh, Igor just said, that uh, we have to keep the... Um, the aim of what we're doing in mind, which is to serve patients and to improve healthcare. And, and actually, from my point of view, um, it's a case of making sure that um, there's patient advocacy in place, which is education and allowing patients to have a say in the digital technologies that they interact with. So one of the things that we're doing at ENCODE is that we're engaging with um, patient groups for each of the sort of, each of the parts of our, of our platform. And so we're speaking to patient groups prior to producing functionality and saying, well, do, does this serve you as a patient group? So we're doing a track and trace system at the moment where we're looking at renal stent paid recipients. Um, and we've gone to their patient group and said, well, we're about to do a study on this. Would it be useful to your patient group if we had a system that tracked these stents that have a limited life, life cycle within the patient? And it's a, it's a clinical never event if this device stays in the patient for longer than six weeks. Would it be useful if we track this process digitally? Would you interact with our product? And I think those are the sorts of conversations we need to be having. And similarly with my, you know, with our colleagues um, professionally saying, well, would it be useful if we have these technologies in place? Yeah. So do we have any questions? I see somebody yeah. there eager to get to the mic. So you folks just mentioned that for digital health, people are not willing to pay. So when it comes to the people who are going to pay you, the first question they ask is, what is in it for me? Hmm. So can you explain to me who are the people you're selling to, digital health, and what is in it for them? B2B versus B2C, whatever. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really good point. So I'll make a start. So, I mean, one thing we didn't touch on the various stakeholders for digital health is a great question and it's, de it's definitely a barrier. Um, so for us, we work between health institutions and suppliers. So actually they're both our customers. And so we can, we've got value propositions for um, suppliers who want to get to patient data. You know, they want to be able to provide direct value added services to the patients they serve, but can't hold that data so they need an intermediary. And equally, they, you know, they, everything's competitive. So the device space is very competitive. So companies can't give away price anymore. They have to start giving away value. And so if we are a conduit to giving value to patients, we can charge for that service. Similarly, the data that we've all been talking about has a massive value to both healthcare institutions, governments, and suppliers. So there's an intrinsic value to that data we hold. So there are multiple revenue streams without having to charge the, the patient themselves. Um, which I agree is an expectation as patients don't want to pay for these services, which I think is fair, yeah. but there are multiple revenue streams. Yes, sir. I agree. I mean, in, in, in the overall, the what is there for you? It's a quality of life, or it means if we improve legislation, we bring the quality to society. This improves yours, not only your organization, this improves your life, your life quality, your family quality, your health. It means there is a lot of improvements in this. Mm. And every model described brings also some innovation as well to the policies. And policies are readable. They bring out new innovation, new, uh, I would say, new challenge. New challenge brings out new idea. New idea brings out new opportunities. How to improve something. But don't forget, there is a new place for improvement. This is well, new place for abusement. Or, so you need both sides. You need smart people, but you need as well precise people. You need as well really strict people. It means technology is so great. It's a great fun, but it's as well really big responsibility. 
I think one of the things uh, when you say we're not willing to pay as, as patients or consumers, I think it's the case of we may be not willing to pay out of our net take home pay, but we're, in the UK we're paying with our taxes. In, in the US we're paying through our, our health care, which you know, we're contributing to our employers' plans or whatever. So we are paying somewhere. The question is where can we ex extract the value and how do we avoid being the product of, so that our data is being sold and, and, and used for value, and we don't really extract the value. I think we've got probably one minute before we get the hook, so what, another question. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I have um, one question that I've sort of faced in the work that I've done has been how you develop buy-in from the providers, the people actually providing the services. And um, one thing that I think I've learned is start with what they want no matter how inane it is if, because starting where they go builds the trust that then they want to develop the things you want i'd like to hear some of your experiences on the other one is a question another one is a question of personal buy-in because i've been a patient of digital uh and i found it very difficult to develop the personal routine to have the time to do the entries and if I had that trouble, I could imagine others need help for it. And I at least work my way through it. So those two. And then the third one is how you deal with provider overload of all the different alerts coming from different places. Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I, I, I can take it. Um, so, so I'm going to answer your uh, last question first, because uh, I think it's the, the most important of provider buy-in. If you're creating a change management operation to you know, do a new decision support uh, workflow for I don't know, prior auth, right? You shouldn't be overburdening the clinician in, in multiple statuses of documentation to achieve a goal. And, and that is that is the cornerstone of successful physician buy-in. You, you can't over art and foch the doc as an example of prior auth to, to document the same ICD-10 code five times in the same workflow. It just doesn't make sense. So obviously the practical application of uh, physician workflow to not overburden them is, is literally the key cornerstone. Um, second to that, uh, as long as you're enabling them with what the clinician has been uh, used to in their own care, we'll also get clinician buy-in. Um, we, we heard it in the last presentation too about uh, Dragon's ambient experience. You know, the clinician wants to talk with the physician, with the patient and have all the documentation work behind them. They shouldn't be spending an hour with the patient and three hours in documentation to achieve that kind of goal. Address, again, addressing physician burden, but doing that in a, in, in a digital operation that's efficient within the workflow always uh, aligns the physician adoption. And then um, third point is obviously if it means more money to the organization or money more money into the doc's pocket, then that's wholeheartedly an accelerator for physician adoption because obviously for every dollar that they put into workflows or FTE operations, they should be getting three to 10 back in, in actual quantifiable ROI. And we as an organization dealing with software applications should be able to position that appropriately. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks to my fellow panelists. Hope you enjoyed this session. We are getting the hook, so thank you. You can always catch us over lunch or through the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.